All right, everyone, on today's episode, we're going to be doing a deep dive into the Roth IRA. This is kind of a continuation of our Back to Basics series. We're just going through the levers, the tools, the investing strategies that are out there for all of us as investors, keeping in mind, simplicity is usually better. So with that in mind, welcome to the Ultimate Crowdsource Personal Finance Show. This is Chooseify. All right, guys, very excited to dive into this week's episode and uh, help me with this. I have my co-host, Brad, here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. And yeah, to your point, we're going to talk about the Roth IRA with with our resident tax expert, Sean Mullaney from the FI Tax Guy. So that's always exciting to have him on the show, certainly. And we actually have him coming up uh, this coming Monday with the annual year-end tax tips and tax checklist. So yeah, we've got a lot of uh, Sean Mullaney, the FI tax guy coming up. You know, this is what's great about this is we actually learned our lesson. So we have Sean on multiple times a year, an amazing guy, the fax, the FI tax guy, just really brings it all together and helps you figure out how to use the tax code in your own financial planning, use it as a tool to help you get to financial independence faster, amazing stuff. Uh, having said that, one of the first years we tried it, we rolled out like tax planning for the current year but we provided at a date that it was less than useful for individuals. And that was just, <laughs> <laughs> that's a very nice way of putting it Jonathan. less than useful. It was slightly too late, slightly too yeah. late. Yep. All right, guys, here's all this amazing info that will take you hours to enact. Uh, the filing deadline is tomorrow. Have fun. <laughs> uh, this time around, you have plenty of notice to get your stuff together. Use it. We'll, we'll do this each year, hopefully going forward and, uh, we'll give people a lot more notice. It's nice. Yeah, this is coming out in November. So yeah, a little pat on the back for ourselves, sadly. <laughs> yep. We're getting, you know, we're getting better at this, Brad. This is the process that you get better at over time. So I wanted to kind of catch people up because I hope they have a sense for what we're trying to rebuild here. We're going back through the content that we produced over the last several years and we're building the foundation for you, just kind of in front of you. So what happened? Uh, we had the Households of Phi series. We have couples from all walks of life, families, single individuals. Uh, different financial backgrounds, uh, get help from in-house experts, from our community, from us on implementing their financial plan. There's a longitudinal study to see how they are doing uh, and we'll be following up them periodically. And then from there, going back into it, now we're going back to basics. When you see the back to basics episode, it was indicating that we're starting to say, okay, that's them. What about you? We rolled out our five-day challenge, which I'll let Brad tell you about just a second. We want you to do this journey with us, with them. Uh, The key is that you get started. We have a free financial independence 101. And it's like a six week long thing. It's completely free to do. But this five day challenge is just say, what if we were to make that even bite size? We know that small actions are important. What if individuals actually got started? So Brad, I guess we'll, we'll keep going with what I'm trying to explain, but just in case someone that was what they were waiting for, I'm ready to get started. If they want to check out the free, the completely free five day challenge, where do they go? And what will they get out of that? Yeah, Jonathan, good point. So like you said, we have uh, a couple of things. So FI 101, first for people who are interested in that, you can go to choosefi.com slash FI101. And to your point, that's a much longer in-depth personal finance course, basically taking you from zero to really everything you need to know to confidently move forward on the path to FI. I think that's, you know, we spent a lot of time in that. It's really in-depth, but you need to put more effort into that, certainly. And we wanted to have a quick start guide in essence. And that's why we created the five-day challenge. And this is basically the fastest way to get up to speed and to take action, more importantly, right? That's what we are constantly talking about here at Chooseify, that it's all well and good to take in this information, but you need to take action. And honestly, the smaller actions are really the best and easiest way to get started here, right? Just prove to yourself that I'm the type of person that can take action to make my life better, to make my financial life better. So that is why we envision this. So. Yeah, I actually recorded uh, five days worth of videos for this, and they're nice short videos with one action step at the end of each day. So if you're interested in that, or if you know anybody in your family, friends, colleagues, circles that might be interested in getting started with FI, just send them to chooseify.com slash start. And you'll see at the bottom of the page, there's a nice simple click for the five-day challenge. So yeah, that's definitely the easiest way to get there is chooseify.com slash start. And so from there, if you think about, so that's your action step, right? And, you know, if, 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 if you're coming on this journey, but in terms of people that listen to the show every single week, have listened to the years, maybe they started at some point, um, we are kind of p- building this in front of you as well, using the podcast medium. And so we, we did this back to basics and we talked about kind of taking a look at your life. How much does your life cost? And then taking a look at your income and understanding how that maps on a path to financial independence. 
There's other pieces to this that we're going to start adding in, understanding, you know, what is your current net worth? How does that affect your fine number? How do you add that in your current assets, your current liabilities, things like that? How do you pay off your, your debt? We have a great episode. If some people are buried, absolutely buried in credit card debt, we have an awesome episode coming up into this year with the debt free guys, really talking about some kind of advanced strategies and just the why of how critical that is. That's going to be useful for you guys. And then, um, what we're doing also though, is we're inve investigating the vehicles. That's what we're going to talk about today with this, with this Roth IRA. And then we're also going to, in the coming weeks, be talking about basic investing strategies. And over the years, we've actually been presented with several very viable ones that have a lot of overlap. They're grounded in simplicity. Um, you need to understand why you're investing the way you are. And we really started with JL Collins. Uh, it's a one fund strategy, kind of talking about uh, low cost, broad based index funds. And then we uh, bridged out of that, that we got some pushback from uh, Todd Tresseter, basically saying it's simple, it works, it's not all there is, there might be some more to look at here. So we just kind of have gone and we looked at what are the various ways that they all have the overlap and that they're grounded in a common sense approach, but there's some nuance to this. So we spoke with, uh, with Paul Merriman. And Paul Merriman basically advocates for similar low-cost, broad-based index funds, but instead of uh, and we're going to use a little definite ter definition of terms here. Instead of using just cap-weighted index funds where the largest companies, particularly the tech companies, which are the higher value ones, you know, those make up a disproportionate amount of your, of your index funds, um, we'll do them by asset class. So we put a certain amount of our money in these big tech companies, a certain amount of money in our uh, smaller companies, our mid-cap companies and different industries. We just get as much di diversification as possible. And we spread our money equally among all of those. And Paul says that over time, that appears to be a premium. And, and you know what? This is always historical. We never know going into the future, but it's a reasonable case to make for sure. That was Paul. And then we talked to Rick Ferry, another phenomenal episode. And he basically talks about, look, simplicity and time in the market is way more than timing. And you want to have a cake and you want to make sure you got your fundamentals in place. And then you're going to add a little bit of icing. You don't want to only focus on icing. All these people that are talking about this crazy stuff like options, tradings, and Forex and there's all this, it's not necessary. You want a common sense, simple investing strategy. Time in the market is going to be better than timing over the long term. So Brad, you know, I think what we want to kind of want to do, and I'll give it back to you is between that and then Brian for all, kind of helping us see the power of just owning great companies that we understand the fundamentals. We own them for the long term, not speculation, but just a belief in where this is going. Where's the common ground there for us as individuals, you and I personally are trying to always optimize but also for the community at large that agrees with us, wants simplicity. And, and I think you and I are basically going to go back to the drawing board and kind of distill all of these different methods and just kind of hash out what our current belief system is and what we're actually doing personally. So that's not going to be today, but it is coming very, very soon. Yeah. And I think, like you said, going back to these experts and just having the conversations again, right? We talked about having JL Collins back on the show and I reached out to him in the last couple of days and he's going to be on in early January, which is great. We should definitely have Brian Feraldi, Paul Merriman, Rick Ferry all back on the show. Because again, as you said, it's about understanding the fundamentals. And what's an interesting point, and, and you've made this to me certainly offline a lot, is about this cap weighting, right? That that's the way that most traditional index funds so Certainly the total stock market index fund and the S&P 500, they are cap weighted. So we talk about not picking individual stocks, right? We talk about that being just like the death knell for investing. But I know you personally, I, I think this is, is very rational thought process. You've been internally conflicted about, okay, sure, I'm theoretically buying an index, but if 20% of my money is going to these five companies, aren't I really stock picking? Yeah. And I mean, that is a very valid point that, again, we all need to just really consider these things from time to time. Now, that's not to say that once we consider them, we're going to change our minds dr dramatically, or maybe we will, right? But I think that's the important thing is to always be open-minded and to always be intellectually honest as to what you're doing and not be dogmatic, right? Like we're not in the practice of being dogmatic for this is the one and only way to invest forever and ever. And I'm just going to close my eyes and assume this is the best, right? That's, that's not the way that intellectually open people behave themselves. So I think just, just really highlighting that you're having that thought process, I think is, is really the big takeaway here that you're applying some scrutiny 
to something that you otherwise might have just taken as dogma. Yeah. And I think, you know, the same journey that you and I are going through personally, the audience that's been with us for years is, is maturing in that same way as well. I mean, when I listen to JL Collins, episode 19 of our podcast for people that haven't listened yet, this is a guy whose blog I had been following, whose stuff I'd found incredibly valuable, who kind of opened up my eyes to the power of just simplicity, the simple path to wealth. And that gave me the confidence to really start doing better with my finance. And I know same thing for you, Brad, doing better with my finances and all these other aspects. I felt like I saw the pattern. I understood the why, and then now building on that for now three or four years. And I'm not saying it's, it's not that I stopped there or didn't stop there, but just saying, I love this. What does it look like to get better at this? And not just, these aren't foreign terms anymore. They're intimately familiar. I have a familiarity, a confidence, a, a, they're fun now. And that's, I think it's for all of us to appreciate that as we spend more time in this, and we see it from different perspectives. We see the pushback. We see the pros. We see the cons. We understand the framework of what we're participating in. The questions that we have get better, right? Uh, the pushback that we have gets better. There should like, yes, questions are good. Pushback is good. You should never just be complacent. It's, there shouldn't be a question that can't be answered. There shouldn't be something that's off limits. Well, we don't ask that question. Like it should be. It, it, everything should be transparent. Everything should be on the table. And then now with that, okay, let's go back to it. So JL, you know, we talked to you, you've been a mentor and a guide for me as I've kind of put together my investing strategy. And I've followed this with great success, great success, unbelievable success. It just worked. But there are these other pieces of data points that I'm encountering and counterpoints and pros and cons and things that I've questioned. I love your take on that now. Clearly, you know, what you've advocated for has just worked for a decade. And it looks like it's worked basically throughout all time since we've tracked the stock market. But is this time different? You know, it's that sort of thing, right? Like, well, and that's a real question that, that people have all the time. Is it different this time? And that's actually what they say. It's a very expensive question to start, you know, <laughs> this time is different is a very expensive uh, mindset to have. But I think it's, 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 it's worth it. It's worth time there just to explore that and just see where it goes. Cause you should be confident on your plan. And then that's just kind of the, I think it's the journey that I'm personally on, but it's also the journey that millions of people around the world are going on, are, are going through right now as well. And the conversation is what's worth having. Yeah. Agreed. And yeah, there should be no questions that are off limits, but I mean, I think clearly at choose if I, we have always talked about being open-minded and we've also always talked about thinking for the long term. We've espouse low fees and how critical that is, right? It's control what you can control. And I think we certainly understand how detrimental significant fees on your investing can be. And we also understand the power of compounding, both in a positive way, like we showed last episode, 272, and in a negative way, when you have fees, both buying and selling stocks or funds, both expense ratios and advisory fees, like taxes, all of this stuff negatively impacts your long-term return. So we want to minimize fees as much as we possibly can, right? These are, these are the bedrock principles. And then to your point, like an investigation of, Hey, what, what are we investing? in? I think that's, that's reasonable. Like in my own life, I was not a real estate investor, right? When we started the show, essentially in January of 2017, I was scared to death of real estate investing. And it was because I had stupidly looked at it as I had a, a speculative disaster that had, that was my own doing. And that scared me for 15 years for real estate investing. And when I applied some scrutiny and when I had some knowledge of looking at it as a business, real estate as a business, not as an appreciation or speculative gamble in essence, then it became something that was very clearly something I wanted to pursue and learn more about. And I've subsequently invested in two single family rentals and they're doing as well or better than I anticipated. So it's, uh, it's cool to see, to see ourselves and all of us right in the Fi community, learn new things and get rid of those limiting beliefs and also not have any sacred cows. I mean, I think that that is just a fundamentally good outlook on life. And I think when you think about it, it's easy to think that when you're talking about the financial independence community, you're talking about money. You're talking about your finances. What we're talking about is, is freedom. It's autonomy. It's mastery. It's purpose. 
And when you think about the lack of knowledge, what, what happens when you don't question the societal norm, when you don't question it, it ends up with you financing stuff to your eyeballs, having to work in a job you barely tolerate to be able to cover a student loan debt that they promised you would enable you to get success with no hope of ever getting back to debt free and certainly no hope of ever being able to reclaim your most precious non-renewable resource, your time. But we all like, we got all this great stuff and we can afford the credit card payments. We can finance it again. Like it's almost like in some cases it feels like without the rule book that we're talking about here, feels like the deck is just stacked against you. You don't have bandwidth. You don't have space. You just try to keep your head down and be a good person and make it work and slowly like hope and optimism fade away. But when you see this, you see this pattern, you reclaim the space on one side, it opens up another level and another level. And suddenly you start realizing you get your health back and all this junk food and crap that was so accessible and easy and the lethargy and the tiredness and the exhaustion, and the lack of optimism that you had in your life. Suddenly you realize you have a little bit more autonomy. You have a little more space. You have hope that you can actually reclaim this most precious renewable resource. That's what financial independence is. It's not finances. It's not money. It's not health. It's not time. It's all of it. It's all of it. It's a framework of looking through what everybody accepts as the norm, what society puts us on us and says, you have to do this. We say, no, we're going to be truth seekers. We're going to question this for ourselves. We're going to make objective, fair-minded judgments about the way the world really is. Not what we want it to be, but the way the world actually is. And knowing what the rule book is, we're going to look for a way to win for ourselves, for our family, and for our community. That is powerful. It's not limited to, it's not, it's not limited to politics. It's not limited to, it's not limited to religion. It's humanity. This is us. What do we want? As humanity, we want more options in our life. This is the path. And we're always getting new information. We're adding that in. We're adding it into our toolbox and it makes us powerful. It makes us powerful as a community. It helps us be leaders in our community. It frees us from just unbelievable amounts of stuff. It's so important to be a part of this conversation. And it's not that like we never make mistakes as human. All of us do. I have made financial mistakes. Brad has made financial mistakes. We have been train wrecks at various points in our life. We're trying to get better. And I know this community is trying to get better. And we're taking in new information and we're putting it through this lens of discernment. And we're saying, here's the best path forward for us at this time right now. There is, you know, it's just that, that's, that's the place that we find ourselves. And it's such a privilege to be a part of this community of people that are just focused on getting a little bit better and controlling what they can control. Wow, Jonathan, I can uh, certainly feel feel the passion exuding out of every pore there. But <laughs> but yeah, I agree. I mean that that is certainly a good mindset for for Phi, right? That is what we believe, and this is really powerful. It's it changes the way you look at life. It changes the way you approach every decision. And I think I think that feeling of of autonomy. It's people crave that, mm. and Sadly, they don't get it in a lot of aspects of life where they may have been following this societal path and to be able to step away and say, wow, I control my destiny. I mean, that is really, really alluring. So, uh, yeah, there's obviously, you know, I'm a, a big proponent of Phi, And I think for, for all of these reasons, this is, this is a mindset towards success. Yeah, you know, Brad, I, I do have a tendency to get a little bit enthusiastic, but it is the, <laughs> it is just the just transformation that this stuff has had in my own life as well. And also, I just feel like it's the tie that binds, right? I mean, you and I don't agree on everything. You know, there's a lot of stuff that we, we're not totally synced up on. We agree on this. This is the path forward. And I think that is where we find ourselves, you know, as a country and as a world, there's a lot of stuff we don't agree on. And we spend all of our time fighting with each other about that. When there's so much that we actually do want, if we could just get there, how much better of a place would this world actually be? And I think this, this idea gives us a, it, it gives, starts to give us a sense for a path forward. So that's, that's hopefully what we can build. All right. So everything we just said, that's what's coming. Brad and I have gone back through years of episodes now and said, if we're building out a framework for this, assuming that people have found the show, maybe when COVID struck, maybe when all of this stuff just went down the tube. Suddenly they had that wake up call and said, I can't go through this again. I need to do better with my finances. I had that wake up call. You know, I realize if you guys have been with us for three or four years, you have access to the same information that we have. We've shared it all with you. Everything that we're learning and taking in, that's what we've shared. But those of you who have not been with us since the very beginning and we don't want to miss anything. So we're just rebuilding all of this out in front of you. We're sharing with you as going. That's the plan. The topics that we just talked about, we're going to be unpacking those. We're going to be exploring those. We're going to be taking the insights, our current perspectives, and additional questions and really just kind of bringing those to the fold to help us build 
a common understanding for what our path forward should be. And um, today, what we wanted to do is we're actually bringing on Sean Mullaney, by tax guy. We referenced him at the beginning, and we're going to be talking specifically about a vehicle called the Roth IRA, the Roth IRA. And uh, it, it will obviously get into the episode and explain the where, the why, the how, nuances to it. It's, it's a one-on-one conversation, a two-on-one conversation. Sean breaks it down. It's going to be an incredible uh, to share it with you. But I just wanted to say we will be coming back to a lot of the topics we just discussed in the coming weeks. And I uh, hope that you guys will stay tuned with us, uh, maybe either on your commute, for those of you that are now back to the office, but for those of you that are home, uh, you know, find a time to work it in when it works for you. All right. With that, uh, let's get right into it. Sean Mullaney, the Phi Tax Guy. All right, everyone. We had a panel earlier this year. And on that panel, we had Phi Tax Guy, Sean Mullaney from PhiTaxGuy.com joining us. And Sean, to be honest, is probably one of the biggest proponents of the Roth vehicle, whether we're talking about Roth IRA or Roth 401k that I have seen or observed in the FI community. And what I love about his perspective is it's deeply embedded in the math and it encompasses our goals, our concerns as people, a group of people that are pursuing financial independence, but recognizing that different people have different needs inside of this banner, this umbrella of financial independence. You have early retirees, you have people trying to pull off maybe slightly early traditional retirees. And you have people that are trying to recover, you know, going into their 60s. Like this is a very big tent. And by design, everybody should be pursuing financial independence. But that requires a more nuanced conversation. And once you understand the nuance, you can better make a decision for your life. We invited him on the show just to kind of share his input and why he gets so excited uh, for the financial independence community, the possibility of employing the Roth and the Roth 401k. So with that, uh, Sean Mullaney, welcome back to the show, man. Jonathan, thanks so much. It's a pleasure to be here. So Brad, uh, kind of set this up for us. You uh, you are participating in this panel that we did in the spring, and I know this one was one that you saw a ton of engagement regarding the topic of the Roth, which is why you suggested that we do this conversation. Give us a sense for like what we're gonna, what you would like for us to talk about today. Yeah, I'm always looking for those patterns in life. And this one just clearly jumped off the page to me. So uh, there is interest in the Roth IRA and there's especially interest in the Roth IRA as Sean describes it. So I definitely want to talk about emergency funds and the possibility of using a Roth IRA as an emergency fund. And also really, I would say kind of the advent of the Roth 401k becoming much more prevalent. So I think those are probably the two big takeaways, but I suspect knowing Sean, there's more there. So Sean, let's, uh, let's jump right into it. So Roth IRA as an emergency fund, tell, tell the audience what we should know about that. Yeah, Brad. And, and this is something that coronavirus actually got me thinking about. And I will say, right, none of this is individual advice for any particular member of the audience. But I'll also say in my practice, I've never met the client or potential client that has come into my virtual office and has had too much in Roth accounts. That fact pattern has never occurred, right? Um, <laughs> I have a feeling six months from now, I'll be using the phrase fact pattern. It's just, it's, <laughs> now it's now embedded in my, in my psyche. <laughs> yeah. So I've never had the case where, oh no, you have too much in Roth accounts. But let, let's um, let's peel it back a little bit, right? So coronavirus happens, and people lose their jobs, and it's a terrible situation. And you can't even go get a job, right, because there's so much of a shutdown. You have a Roth IRA, and you have a workplace 401k. Let's just traditional 401k, pre-tax, you have an, a Roth IRA. The workplace 401k is a very tough nut to crack, right? Your employer doesn't even have to allow you to take distributions out of that thing. Okay, let's think about that for a second, right? There's no law requiring them to allow you to take any sort of distribution. And if they do allow it, it's probably subject to ordinary income tax and a 10% penalty. It may not be subject to the 10% penalty, but it likely is. All right, let's contrast that to the Roth IRA. If you've been contributing to the Roth IRA for many years, you have many years of built up so-called contributions. Right. So let's just say you contributed $6,000 every year for five years. That's $30,000. You can access that $30,000 at any time for any reason, tax and penalty free. You can do something very un FI, right? You can go to Vegas and play craps and <laughs> blackjack and poker. Not a wise decision, but fully allowable and no tax, no penalty. Okay. 
Um, and here's the other thing too. Your Roth IRA is not with your employer. It's with your chosen financial institution, likely a discount brokerage. They are very flexible and you know, they will allow you to have access to these accounts. They often are going to say, you know, hey, wait a minute, are you sure you want to take it on the digital platform? But you're allowed to do it. So I bring that up because we face a world of uncertainty. And you never know when you're going to need access to these accounts. And this also matters for early retirement, right? We talk about things like Roth conversion ladders and, and those sorts of things. The Roth IRA is really well suited for your early retirement too, because if you've got historic contributions in there, you can always access them tax and penalty free. And so the, the Roth IRA can serve as sort of a backdoor emergency fund, definitely a only break in case of emergency. But when we talk about, hey, you know, I'm young, I only have limited savings, I know I should have some sort of an emergency fund. Well, maybe what you do is you start investing in the Roth IRA and it does double duty to start, right? You build up your finances and you know you've got access to it in an emergency. And then later on, as you get a little more established, maybe you start funding a separate emergency fund. So that's out there. And you could even do a backdoor Roth IRA and use that as an emergency fund. Now there you get into, I call them micro layers. And I, I re recently wrote a Roth IRA withdrawal uh, article. Hopefully you guys can link to that in the show notes. But what you could do is, let's say you did a backdoor Roth IRA of $6,000, but it had you know $10 of interest, say. So when you did the conversion piece, you reported $6,010 and actually paid tax on that $10 of growth. If you were to say take out three thousand dollars later on, and you never made any contributions, the first ten comes out as, as subject to a ten percent penalty. Well, it's a one dollar penalty. Who really cares? And then the rest of the distribution, two thousand nine hundred ninety dollars of that three, tax and penalty free too. So yeah, th these things are are great vehicles for tax free growth, but they have this great secondary function in an uncertain world where they can be sort of a backdoor emergency account. And just for context for people, someone hearing backdoor Roth IRA, you know, the, the Roth IRA is a vehicle that you have access to outside of your uh, 401k or retirement accounts. It needs to be, it's funded by uh, earned income. So you do need to be earning income in order to fund it. And up to a certain limit, uh, and I'm sure Sean, you can fill in the details here, up to a certain wage that you've earned, an AGI or an MAGI, you can just go through the front door. And if you can go through the front door, you should just go through the front door. When we talk about back doors, there are high income earners that if they understand the rules, there are ways to work around that. And so they go in the back door and it is legal, completely legal. So you shouldn't just write it off because you make too much, but it's, it's slightly more complicated. Sean, would you add anything on to that? I just wanted to kind of give people a sense for why we're talking about a, a regular Roth IRA versus a backdoor Roth IRA. Absolutely, Jonathan. Uh, the backdoor applies when you've made too much money in a year to make a regular contribution to a Roth IRA. I'm actually looking at the recently released IRS 2021 phase outs for the uh, income limitation for Roth IRA in 2021. It's going to be 198,000 if you are married uh, to 208,000. And for singles, it's going to be 125,000 to 140,000. So the big Starting points are: Is my adjust modified adjusted gross income 198,000 or less in 2021? If I'm married, 125,000 or less if I'm single. If that's true, then just go ahead and rate make a regular $6,000 Roth IRA contribution. Right? If you're age 50 or more, it's actually 7,000 is your limit. But let's say you're above those two numbers, the 198 and the 125, then you need to start thinking about this backdoor Roth IRA. I and many others in the FI community have blogged on the backdoor Roth IRA in terms of you know what you need to make sure you've got set up. We also have a New Year's Eve issue with the backdoor Roth IRA. Generally speaking, backdoor Roth IRAs make sense if you have no other traditional IRA, SEP IRA, or simple IRA. And the the key deadline for like what I call cleaning those things out is December 31st of any year, right? So if you're at the end of 2020 and you're thinking, oh, maybe I'll do a backdoor Roth IRA for 2020, but you have an old traditional IRA from an old employer, it was a 401k, you rolled it over, you're actually probably not a good candidate for the backdoor Roth IRA. No problem, right? Because either there are other ways to skin the cat, there are other ways to financial independence, 
or you take action, you get that old traditional IRA into your new employer plan, a, a, a direct roll in from the old traditional IRA to your new employer 401k, and then you're clean, right? You have no other balances in traditional IRAs, and you can then do the so-called backdoor Roth IRA. I and others, you know, I've blogged extensively about the different ways to set up a backdoor Roth IRA to make sure it's tax efficient. And again, it's just a way of, hey, I make too much money, but I still get the benefits of, of the Roth by doing a two-step transaction instead of a one-step transaction. Yeah, Sean, that's great. And obviously, there's a lot of complexity with with that back to our Roth. So I'd advise certainly reading your articles and, and people doing their research in that. But what's cool about this conversation already is there's something for everybody, right? Those people who are higher income earners and who are looking for that ability. Okay, they just learned maybe for the first time potentially about that back to our Roth. But as we started out, the emergency fund, right? Using your regular Roth. And I think this is, this is my big takeaway so far is that, and I want to make sure everybody really understands this, your contributions to a Roth IRA can be withdrawn tax and penalty free at any point. So as you described in your hypothetical, that person had five years at $6,000, they have $30,000 of contributions in their Roth IRA that may have and should have grown over that, right? So there's there's earnings in that account. So 30,000 isn't their balance, but 30,000, that's the contributions they've made, the cumulative contributions they've made. And that money can be withdrawn tax and penalty free at any point. So that's your entire contention about using this as an emergency fund, right? You're You're making the smart choice. You're putting it in this retirement vehicle that have other benefits clearly, but you are reserving the right to say, if in a worst case scenario, I needed for emergency fund money, I still have that ability tax and penalty free. Absolutely, Brad. And you mentioned the earnings, right? The earnings can only come out tax and penalty free if you've held in a Roth IRA for five years and you're 59 and a half. There's a couple other exceptions out there we're not going to bore the, bore the audience with, but essentially it's 59 and a half and five right on those earnings, right? So the earnings are at least somewhat trapped, but again, that's not that big of a problem because like we've talked about, you've got access to those contributions and leaving those earnings in to grow tax and penalty free till your age 59 and a half or above is actually a really good thing. I think it's really important for people to hear nobody on this call. I think all of us would be aghast if we were to raid our Roth IRAs for the purposes of a flat tire, a, you know, like, Maybe even Vegas a broken trip. water heater, certainly a trip to Vegas. Yeah. The, 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 like there, there are very few reasons that, cause, cause Sean, once you pull it out, it's not like, Hey, let me repay my emergency. I think we should really talk about the dark. It's yes, you can, but extreme discretion. Yes. And, and I think, you know, in my experience working with members of the FI community, folks are really good about this. They understand, you know what? It's in a Roth. It only comes out until I'm you know, it comes out maybe when I'm retired, according to a well-crafted plan or in an extreme emergency, right? So you're absolutely right, Jonathan. The money cannot be put back in. Uh, I mean, there are some, there's something called a 60-day rollover, which you don't want to plan into. So let's just, I mean, technically it could go back in in a 60-day rollover, but you generally do not want to be in that boat, right? So yes, we want the money to stay in there. And actually, let me bring up a related point, health savings accounts, which I know you guys are very fond of. I see the flip on Roth IRAs. I rarely see money coming out of them before folks are retired. That's fantastic. On health savings accounts, I actually see the flip. I see a lot of folks saying, hey, I sprained my ankle. I have a $400 doctor bill. Here's my HSA debit card. Please take the money out. Same rule applies, though, as with a Roth IRA. Don't do it, right? Leave that money in the health savings account to grow tax and penalty free as well, right? So, Jonathan, you make a really good point. When you've got money in tax-free growth, in tax-free accounts, leave it in there so it can keep growing. The second you take it out, generally speaking, you've stopped that growth. So, you know, with the HSA, I, I like to recommend to folks, you know what, when you go to the doctor and you've got the sprained ankle, pay out of pocket, pay with your checking account, leave the money in the health savings account, let it grow. Now, yes, if you get heart attack, cancer, terrible accident, you're fighting for your life absolutely drain your HSA, you know, fight for your life. 
but for your regular routine uh, medical expenses, use just regular checking accounts, credit card, you know, pay it regularly. And then years from now, you can actually reimburse yourself for that. So that's a different conversation. But yeah, leave that money in there to grow tax and penalty free. And Sean, you're certainly describing the position of strength that most of us in the FI community find ourselves in, right? Like that advice would probably not be heeded by the vast majority of of society, right? Because the whole point of them putting this money in the HSA is so that they can use it for those health costs that come up. But for us, because we do have additional money saved and we're not looking, it's not, we're not worried about when the next paycheck is going to come in to be able to cover our bills. We can make decisions from a position of strength. So clearly having that money in the HSA, paying the health bill out of pocket, like you said, and then documenting that payment, right? Like you're documenting what these expenses were and you're holding that, right? And I'd, you know, I'd love at some point to, to hear if you have a different strategy than us, but what Jonathan and I both do is we just scan those, those invoices or the bills you receive, put them to a Google drive. And then who knows decades from now, we'll have the ability to pull that money out of our HSAs when we want to, again, from that position of strength and not from, oh no, I can't cover this hundred dollar bill from the doctor. I need to pull it out of my HSA. That's a great strategy, Brad. And yeah, you're right. It's all about building up your financial strength. So you have more options, right? So if, if bad things happen, you have more options. And as you have more options, you have more ability to optimize, right? So, you know, it, it you get to a point where, hey, I've got a million dollars in financial wealth and I've got a sprained ankle and you have $50,000 in a checking account and 40,000 in an HSA. Why are you tapping that HSA, right? You've got plenty of money in your checking account. You can afford the the sprained ankle bill, go ahead, keep optimizing, and you get stronger and stronger. They're stronger, become even stronger. And so that's, I think, a really good point about financial independence and tax optimization. It's like, let's get a little stronger every day so we have more options so we could become even stronger. All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that segment. I just wanted to, if you enjoyed this and you want more of it, keep in mind, this upcoming Monday is going to be the episode again with Sean Mullaney, and we're going to be talking about tax planning tips for this tax planning year. Um, we've given you plenty of notice. You have tons of time to take action on this. He's going to give you a checklist. You're going to be very clear on what you need to get in place going into the tax deadline, which Brad, and I believe that's usually mid April. Is that, is that still accurate? Yeah. April 15th is uh yeah. Tax filing deadline for 10 It was a little squirrely this year, but let's be realistic. The whole year was squirrely. So, uh, <laughs> normally April 15th. Uh, <laughs> um, all right. So, uh, we'll, We'll, we'll come back to that. I also want to say we also have another segment planned with Sean. We're going to be talking about the Roth 401k. We talked about that just maybe in passing there, but that's kind of an interesting thing that, to be honest with you, my familiarity with it is almost nil. The very last year that I was working at a pharmacist with a corporate pharmacy chain, they had just started to introduce it. I didn't know how to leverage it. I didn't know how where it fit in this planning. And, and over the last couple of years, it's starting to become more common that employers are offering it. So we're going to be coming back to that episode in the coming weeks. But I mean, we just have so much content planned. It's going to be amazing. Lock it in, press subscribe. So as we uh, start to wrap up this episode, I just want to share with you, we have a couple wins this week from people in the community that have taken some massive action. Uh, people that are, are, that are sharing their wins with us are doing it because they are subscribed to our newsletter, weekly newsletter. Uh, that comes out once a week from Brad, includes an actionable tip, a, a personal challenge, an update from the community. Uh, it's really become one of the most popular uh, um, newsletters or things that we've done on a regular basis, probably ever. And we get hundreds, if not thousands of responses that you let us know you're taking action each and every week. Brad reads all of them personally. He literally dedicates a whole day to going through these. And we highlight a couple of them on the show. If yours is read, we want to send you one of the books from our Chooseify publishing department. We have our book, Choose a Buy Your Blueprint to Financial Independence. And we actually have three or four other books, which will help you depending on your specific situation, whether it's entrepreneurship, uh, whether it is second generation FI, how do I incorporate these money lessons to my kids, individuals that are dealing with a pension, um, 
How do I know whether to stay or go? How do I value my pension? A lot of options there. All you need to do to enter the drawing is just first be on the newsletter. You can go again to choosefi.com slash start. And then when you get that weekly uh, uh, invitation from Brad to share your wins, just share with us what you took action on this week. And we would love to include you in that drawing. So with that, Brad, what do you have for us today? All right, Jonathan, the first winner here is John. And John said, hi, Brad. To date, this is my most proud 1% improvement. My wife and I moved nearer to family and negotiated $100 per month off of our rent by offering to pay six months in advance, which was possible by using the cash we had sitting aside for a future home down payment. With interest rates so low for online savings account, I was thrilled to have less cash sitting on the sidelines. We were able to choose the living situation that was preferable to us by thinking outside the box to negotiate the price down and lower our expenses elsewhere. We knew this location would allow me to bike to work which meant we could become a one-car family. Jonathan, I know you love that. And lower our monthly transportation costs. Ultimately, our total monthly expenses stayed about the same, but we gained much more living space for our little kids and our quality of life will be much better for this season. Multiple wins for us. And I believe it was even a win for the person who owns the home we are renting from, which made for the successful negotiations. Everything is negotiable, right? Thank you for the inspiration to negotiate that I have to assume was help help to spark that thought in my head to at least ask. So John, first off, that's incredible. And Jonathan, and to the audience, this is one of the things, the themes that I've seen in so many of the responses to the FI Weekly is that concept of everything is negotiable and it never hurts to ask, right? These are things we've talked about just kind of in passing here at Choose a Violet. I have seen people mention that back to me more times than I can count that that one concept just made a huge difference for them, that it never hurts to ask. It never hurts to think outside the box and to think about these win-wins, right? In John's case here, he offered to pay six months of this rent when who's doing that, right? Most landlords are worried, are are my renters going to be able to pay this month, right? And think about how much safety and security it gives that landlord to get six months in advance, to have somebody who's financially stable enough to do that. So John and his family won by getting $100 per month off and the landlord won by getting this security. So it's one of these things, it never hurts to ask. And I've seen countless instances of people just doing interesting things, even down to, I just got one this morning, somebody sent a like a DM on Twitter to like Comcast or Verizon, I think it was actually, asking for a $5 per month off coupon because they had seen somebody mention it in a Facebook group somewhere, one of our, our Facebook groups. And it was like, you know, the guy said, I saved $20. It was no big deal, but it's still, it's $20, right? And when you do that over and over, that took him two minutes to do. When you do, when you're looking for these things, you never know when that $20 turns into a hundred dollars per month, turns into asking for 30% off of your hospital bill or something. And it's thousands of dollars, right? Like this is the mindset and the mindset is the critical portion here. Mm. Yeah, that, that that's huge. You know, you, you, you do have, you do have some agency. There is no matter how bad it is, there is something that we have control or some action that we can take. And, uh, just knowing what your options are and saying, you're not going to do everything, but if you're not happy with where you're at, you are going to have to do something. And, uh, it sounds like John is just absolutely crushing it. And that's the cool thing. When you just take a few of these steps, no matter how small, the bandwidth that affords you allows you to be more aggressive with the next thing that you lean on. And sometimes you can get to the point of unreasonable, unreasonable. And then it just happens because you had the space to look for it. There's a lot of people whose jobs have become uncertain over the last year. There's a lot of industries whose future and outlook has become uncertain. Uh, it's just, you know, it's just, it's been a tough year. It's been a tough year. A lot of people got laid off during COVID. Some of them, their jobs have come back. Some of them, they haven't. And some of them just have uncertainty about when it's going to come back. And, uh, I, I was thinking through this problem earlier this year when I launched another small podcast called uh, talent stacker, um, which we've talked about now on the show once or twice. But what I did is I worked with Bradley, Brad, who'd actually come on our show. And I'm telling this to you. I know, you know, this, but just for our audience, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's, guys, that's the nature of a show like this. Brad and I we do. We, he is up to date. <laughs> <laughs> you are talking to me, but you're actually talking to the audience. <laughs> uh, so Bradley, who's actually been on this show, um, he was sharing with us how he basically made over a million dollars in around 10 years with Salesforce. Um, you know, just, just unbelievable, unbelievable. And how he's making even more than that now, even after going to part-time. 
their opportunity and, and being able to work remote, by the way, as well. And, you know, at first you just think it's an outlier. And then because we had the conversation, my interest was so intrigued. I went back to him and I said, wait, is this like really replicable? Like no college degree required, six month certification, making 60 to 80 K basically right out the gate with a clear path to like 150 and, and potentially even the ability to work remote, especially now during this era that we're living in right now. These are the sorts of things. Everybody just feels like they have to go back to college. They have to go take out more debt. And they're just, it's just kind of scary. Like this is the only path for you to like get another mulligan or retrain into a different industry. Like our role here, our job is to highlight options that you can choose that have great ROI. And you can rescale, retrain, save, like get more control over your life quickly. So I worked with Bradley to, uh, to help build a job placement program, a job training program. People go through this program, they scale up, they get their certifications quickly and they learn exactly the one, two, three, four steps to get these jobs. We're having students go from no training in Salesforce to now getting jobs within four months, making 60 to 80 K, even though they got laid off during a pandemic. One of our students who've been trying to do this on his own and just what didn't feel like he was getting any traction, started this course, immediately got the fix that he needed. Within 42 days, he got, he got laid off in COVID, making like 38K, 35K, something like that. Within 42 days, he was able to land a job that paid over 70,000. Over 70,000, 42 days from the time he started the program now. And now we're seeing this replicated over and over again, even when there's uncertainty, even when things are going bad. If you can keep your eyes out, you look for opportunities, you can turn this around. So I say all that to say I built, help Bradley build a, a, a training program around this for individuals. And just to kind of give you a peek of what it might look like, one for you, if you just want to do it on your own, you want to go rogue and do this. Or two, if you're interested in the program, we have a free five-day challenge. It's absolutely free. And it will show you the path if you want to do this on your own, how you could reasonably pull this off in six months. At the end of that, if you want to continue and have Bradley and us actually work with you to help you retrain into one of these fields, it will show you how you can do that as well. But just for our audience, if you're one of these people that all this sounds great, but right now you're just trying to keep, figure out how to keep food on the table. You're just trying to figure out how to pay your bills. You are a small business owner and your business is getting, going into shutdown again, whatever that might look like, right? Whatever is happening. And you're saying, I, I don't have, I don't see the path right now. If that's the case, this is, this is an opportunity. This is real. This is really happening. Just check it out. That's it. It's completely free. Go to talentstacker.com slash Salesforce. If you know someone that's concerned about their ability to earn income for their family, if you know someone that's concerned about career prospects in the industry that they're in, whatever, a teacher, health conditions, worried about what might happen this fall. A, there are so many industries where there's just a lot of uncertainty right now you need to go look at this program. The good news is like this program gives you the map, the roadmap. If you want to do it completely for free, you can do it completely for free. You can be in this situation six months from now, making it 60 to 80 K. If you want a mentor and a coach and someone, a study group and someone to work with you and step-by-step, -step, so you have the confidence that this is the path and it will get me there. There's that too. All of it's right there. Go to talentstacker.com slash Salesforce. You do have autonomy. You do have agency. And with good information and good options, you can crush this game, no matter what the world throws at you. All right, my friends, the fire is spreading. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled.